This video is for Derek for MythVision, and it's on the relationship between extraordinary claims and how they relate to metaphysics, and how in turn this affects one's methodology in interpreting the relationship between myths and religious claims. I'm using a different format than usual. I usually completely script all of my videos, whereas today I'll be following a scripted outline, but I'm not using a full script today as there is uh, simply far too much material to cover for that. So hopefully I won't end up rambling too much, but I just want to share some frank thoughts that may take a bit more to elaborate on than what I would normally do in a scripted video. So hopefully this goes well. Also, before we begin, I have a little disclaimer. Today we're going to be examining a lot of extraordinary claims of all types, not only those found in religion, and considering the possibility that they might be real. This does not mean I think any of these claims are real. Uh, we are simply exploring them as hypotheticals to illustrate one way one might think about extraordinary claims in general. As Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it, which is what we're going to do. Anyway, to begin, Derek, I recently listened to two of your videos. One was on the Book of Enoch, which I found particularly interesting, and the other was on the Gospels being loaded with myth and legend. I have the links in the description if anyone is interested. So while watching these and having seen some of your comments on your preferred assumptions elsewhere, like on Facebook and so on, I noticed something wrong. Essentially, you're making two mistakes, with one following from the other. However, in fairness, it isn't really your fault that you're making these, as to be honest, most of your opponents are making the same mistakes, or in the second case, are making complementary mistakes. Actually, I saw both of these problems a mile away before I started the Quantum Idealist movement, and even before I made any videos on YouTube at all. I was quiet about them because when your side is making a mistake, you don't want to say it out loud. But well, it's inevitable now anyway, and given my own religious trauma experience, I really don't care for this chill game anymore anyway. So I'm going to spill the beans about a few things. In essence, you're caught up in a false dialectic between two wrong or partially wrong positions, and you're taking the better of the two positions, not realizing that it itself is flawed as well. The first problem involves metaphysics. I've seen you comment on Facebook that you have a materialist metaphysics, and this shapes how you think about extraordinary religious claims being real versus being myth. And so this position is essentially a Democritus's atoms in the void position. So in essence, you have uh, empty space that goes on forever, and that's the arena for particles of matter. Um, you know, the Greeks would call them atoms, today we call them subatomic particles, and then everything is either those particles or configurations of those particles, and there really isn't any room for anything else. Now, your opponents, by contrast, have a dualist metaphysics, which is almost the same as um, materialist metaphysics in uh, some noted ways. It's, it's got the exact same naive realist view about the nature of what matter is and the nature of space. The only difference is it has this little dollop of supernaturalism pasted on top. And uh, this supernatural stuff interacts by magic. There is no rational way you can explain how it um, has any kind of causal power on the world when it does something it's essentially the same as sprinkling pixie dust on something and all of a sudden it just changes stuff by magic with with no possibility for a rational explanation or a law of physics applied to it or anything of that sort okay now to make matters worse uh it's only the supernatural stuff in our religion that is real so this is the supernatural metaphysical stuff is only it's kind of trademarked to have our religion on it and of course the one true religion as everyone knows is the john from cult of vanuatu which has um we, we can explain airplanes this way because airplanes are magic uh because we're um primitive uh, islanders from the south pacific and we don't know any better and um the the, the flying of airplanes is proof of our religion and it's not the proof of the religion of those heretics over in the other island uh, who are part of the Prince Felipe movement because uh, their cargo cult is, is the wrong religion. And so their supernatural stuff and all of their supernatural claims do not work. And so whenever they report airplanes in their religion, it's all false. Okay, so um, so that's, that's your, essentially your um, dialectic you're stuck in. So now if you're stuck with those two options, of course, materialism is going to be preferable. Now, you may want to add a panpsychist modification on, um, just to tell the hard palm, 
but it's still functionally materialism. A little aside, uh, panpsychism does have something called the combination problem, which is a serious issue with it, but it's still better than the interaction problem for dualism or the hard problem for materialism. So it's 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 a it's a problem, but it's not a de facto an automatically um, impossibly like it's not an automatic impossible defeater for panpsychism the way that interactionism is for dualism or the hard problem is for materialism. However, this Adams in the Void view constrains one's sense of the possible. Anything that isn't a materialist-based explanation becomes extraordinary by default. The problem with this is that both of these are simply completely wrong. Maybe not completely wrong. With materialism, you can save nomology, which is that everything is law-like and obeys uh, laws of nature, uh, things we can study with science. And with dualism, you can save the immateriality of the mind. But other than that, these are simply very obviously wrong when you look past just a little bit into it. Uh, the first one we can know, this is from philosophy of mind with the hard problem. The hard problem in materialism is how to derive irreducible first person men mental properties from irreducible third person material properties. And the laws of epistemology prevent you from being able to derive unlike terms from unlike terms. So this is not something that is like a just a problem we have to solve. This is a this is an unsolvable problem by the rules of epistemology. Epistemology tells us this problem cannot have a solution. Not only does it not have a solution, it cannot have one. And dualism has the exact same problem in reverse with the interaction problem. In this case, you start with first person mental properties that are also irreducible, and that's your, your cause. And somehow this has to produce an effect that has is, is based on, you know, third person irreducible material properties. And there, there's simply no way to bridge the first person to third person gap with any kind of logical explanation. And so in ca both cases, you have this, this breakdown in logical explanation where something just, you know, consciousness just appears from matter by magic or mind just affects matter by magic. Yeah, th this doesn't work. And so because of this, it's very obvious. These are these are intractable problems. These pro these these ontologies simply have to be wrong. Uh, now we go into uh, the problem of perception and phenomenology, which is another way to point out these are wrong. But um, we can not do that right today. We're going to go into uh, physics instead. Physics is the best science that could possibly tell us about materialism, right? So when you think of materialism, you're thinking of atoms in the void in the Democritean sense. And so the problem here is that, um, well, when you actually look at what the science is saying about those atoms in the void, uh, and the best area of science to do this is physics, the physics is telling us that neither of these actually exist. There is no atoms and there are no void. There are what we you know, perceive as atoms, so subatomic particles, but um, quantum non-realism experiments, such as the Leggett inequality violation in 2007, show very clearly that there is no um, physical reality to these atoms. It's a perception being generated by quantum information, which is itself non-spatial. And uh, this may surprise you, but um, the Nobel Prize in Physics was actually awarded for this just two years ago. Now, um, you might say that this is just some kind of strange quantum interpretation, that we don't have to worry about this. This is just a kind of obscure interpretation of quantum mechanics, and so therefore, we can kind of push this off under the rug, and this is actually not true. Uh, this is not a matter of interpretation anymore. We'll get to that in a little bit, but um, both quantum gravity and quantum mechanics are now telling us that, uh, regardless of interpretation, that space does not exist. And if space doesn't exist, well, the matter in space doesn't exist either. So firstly, I'm going to note that not all quantum interpretations are created equal. And there are actually two general classes of quantum interpretations. There are the theory-motivated interpretations, which take some aspect of quantum theory and then hammer that out into a quantum interpretation. And then there are the speculative interpretations, which try to inject some kind of heterodox physics into the theory in order to explain the quantum weirdness away. And those would include things like Bohmian mechanics, superdeterminism, or objective reduction. The problem with these is that they tend to be very highly ad hoc. Uh, Bohmian mechanics, for example, requires a very unorthodox view of relativity, which requires twice as many premises as the normal view. And then not only that, but you need a special pleading exemption in Bohmian mechanics 
from that relativity in order to explain the, the non-local pilot wave influence. And that's not the only problem with it. There are a number of other problems which need other ad hoc additions to it. And then you try and solve those, and then those need further ad hoc assumptions added in, and so on and so forth. And so now you have this whole, um, this problem with this very highly, it very quickly becomes a very highly ad hoc train wreck. And uh, it's not equivalent to something from a theory motivated interpretation, which simply just takes quantum theory as is as a premise and then hammers details out of it. And then other problem, other um, speculative interpretations have even worse problems. Uh, super determinism, for example, that uh, basically treats all the quantum states in the universe as being kind of fixed uh, in such a way as to trick the experimenter into believing that quantum mechanics actually has these strange ontological implications when in reality it's just kind of deceiving the experimenter to think the world is immaterial or non-local or whatnot when in reality it's material, which is, I mean, at that point you're at divinely planted fossils territory. Um, now, when you go over to the theory-motivated interpretations, however, and so the point here, going back for a second, the speculative interpretations are very ad hoc and they're not they're not equal, they shouldn't be weighted on the same weight as something like the theory motivated interpretations. So now when you go to the theory motivated interpretations, they generally fall into one of two branches. There is the Copenhagen branch, which um, that would include things like the Copenhagen interpretation, the orthodox view, um, relational quantum mechanics, Bayesian interpretation, the information theoretic interpretation. All of these imply some connection to mentality or idealism. And so um, now it's kind of funny, actually, the Copenhagen branch, the orthodox interpretation really is the Copenhagen interpretation made coherent. But the problem is a lot of scientists like to take Copenhagen instrumentally because they don't like the conclusion. And so they kind of treat it as its own thing and treat it only as a, um, a way of instrumentally predicting things. And they then pretend the model they're predicting doesn't have any width, does not have any um, objective reality in its own right, which is a very profoundly unscientific way of looking at things. It's like saying, we know evolutionary theory works, we know it predicts things like fossil placement and uh, marker genes and so on, but we're going to just treat that as an instrumental reality. It's not really how things are. Young Earth creationism is really how things are, but we're just going to treat the model as instrumentally true. And that, that that's that's insane, in my view. That That's a very anti-scientific way of looking at the world. Now there is the Everett branch, which this comes from the superposition principle in physics, and it tries to explain why there are superpositions in quantum mechanics, all these different branches of the multiverse, it explains it with. Um, and so the thing with this is, is people like to say this is materialist, right? Because the, the particle has objective material properties, they're just in some other universe, and then when you collapse the wave function, you select out that universe in a nutshell. Um, well, that sounds good on face value. The problem is, is the ever branch has this little thing called the preferred basis problem, which is why, you know, if all these are just classical trajectories in different universes in the multiverse, then why should any of the universes ever have displayed wave behavior? And then, you know, why then would our universe, why would we know that there is a wave nature to quantum mechanics in our own universe? And it turns out that there is a, at least I'm told, there is a a solution to this preferred basis problem. A friend of mine named Gunter pointed this out to me. It was from a lecture from Sean Carroll, which very unfortunately was taken down from YouTube due to copyright infringement. If someone can find this lecture, I would be very grateful. Uh, but unfortunately, it is no longer on YouTube. Um, the problem here is that there is a solution to this, but that solution requires something called emergent space-time. Remember beforehand when I said that quantum gravity said that space doesn't exist? Well, this is the aspect of quantum gravity that says that space doesn't exist. In a nutshell, it says that there is some level of reality that is non-spatial and non-material that is more fundamental than the spatial material reality that we see, and that our spatial slash material reality emerges as a construct or an illusion from that deeper level of reality. So in a nutshell, space in emergent space-time is no more real than the space in a video game or in a matrix, and it's saying that that's that's the, the space-time that we see in our world is essentially the space-time as it would exist in the Matrix or in a video game. And so obviously then, that, that's completely incompatible with materialism. A, a material object in the Matrix is no more real than it would be in a dream. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a real thing, it's an illusion. 
And then furthermore, it turns out that uh, you can actually get something very M MWI-like from idealist metaphysics. Like, take the physics out altogether, just forget that for a second. If you start with just idealist metaphysics, you can very inter interestingly derive something that looks very astonishingly similar to MWI the other way around, just from pure metaphysics. There's a very uncanny resemblance to it. And basically what it says is that it's a, a modal reality. There are these modal realities in God's. Our world is an idea, and then God's mind contains all possible ideas. You know, all possible platonic forms exist in a nutshell. And so because of that, because, you know, we're an idea, and we're not ontologically different than any of those, those have to be worlds as well. But they all exist in, you know, God's mind, which is what's generating our world. And from our view, this is like a collective unconscious that is beneath our space-time, i.e. in the wave function, that's the quantum information which space emerges. And so therefore, you end up with all these different modal realities in the uh, kind of collective unconscious from which the world emerges inside of idealism. And so it has this very uncanny resemblance to MWI, even as the location of the multiverse in the same space in this, uh, you know, the Hilbert space underneath the merchant space-time. So yeah, uh, quantum mechanics has pretty much done away with materialism, either on the Copenhagen branch or the Everett branch. Everett branch doesn't explicitly bring in consciousness, doesn't require that, but it still gets rid of matter by way of the solution of the per preferred basis problem. So materialism is done insofar as quantum mechanics is concerned. And you can go around the uh, speculative interpretations, but those become very ad hoc very quickly, and there's no... Um, no real reason to believe them, except that you want to somehow square quantum mechanics with materialism, which is it's really a, a question-begging motivation if you think about it. This connection between quantum mechanics and mentality is actually very obvious when you look at polls of physicists on quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, in 2011, there was a, a survey done of physicists' opinions on quantum mechanics and when it came to the observer, they said uh, one of the options was um, it plays a fundamental role in the application of the formalism, but plays no distinguished physical role. And 55% of respondents actually answered up, selected that, as opposed to only 6% which said plays a distinguished physical role. So what's very interesting here is they're admitting in the poll response that the formalism, I mean, the theory, aka the formalism, uh, tells us that the observer plays a role in quantum mechanics. But then they go on to say um, it doesn't play a distinguished physical role. So in other words, they have this theory that they admit is what, you know, this predicts reality very well, but then they suddenly go and negate their own theory by saying it doesn't play a distinguished physical role. And, you know, that, that's not that's not something that comes from science. That's their opinion that's being, because the science is where the, that's what, that's the formalism. And so here they are essentially kind of denying or taking an instrumental approach to their own science simply to avoid this issue of the observer, which is a very transparent motivation. And then, of course, at the same time, a lot of these experiments were coming out that were showing that um, quantum mechanics was indeed contradicting materialism. And then, like, five years later, they have this other poll, and the same question gets asked, and then suddenly the the answer of plays a distinguished role jumps to 22%, which is pretty standard uh, when it comes to a quantum interpretation. No quantum interpretation is gonna be, you know, really have much of a majority. And so 22% is actually very good for a interpretation of quantum mechanics. So this is actually not really a fringe view at all. In fact, it's, it should be the standard view. And you can see even that the, the physicists themselves are, you know, indirectly, tacitly implying that consciousness causing collapse or whatnot, or playing a role in the formalism, um, this, this does come out of the theory. It's just they don't want to believe their own theory, and they, they even kind of tacitly admit, admit as much in these polls. So that's what quantum mechanics tells us, but now let's go over to particle physics for a second, because that actually reinforces the picture we just got from quantum mechanics. So this right here is something called a Feynman diagram, and Feynman diagrams are used in particle physics to calculate particle interactions. And even though this looks pretty simple in all but the simplest of cases, this actually becomes very complex very quickly, and so much so, in fact, that physicists would need to not be able to do this themselves, that they would actually program supercomputers to do this, and the supercomputer would then chug out a response after a couple weeks of calculation. However, that all changed in 2013 when Nina Arkani Hamed discovered something called the Amplitude Hedron. 
and the amplitudehedron um, it was like a revolutionary new way of calculating particle interactions. And it was such that you could take those very complex Feynman diagram calculations that would take a supercomputer weeks and weeks to calculate, and a physicist could then calculate that same thing on a single sheet of paper in a couple of minutes using the amplitudehedron. Now, that's a very remarkable breakthrough, and obviously it points to deeper physics. The thing, however, is that what makes it so powerful is that the amplitudehedron treats the particles as not actually existing inside of physical space-time. They treat them as this, you know, part of this amplitudehedron structure, and then what we're seeing as material particles, like electrons and protons and mesons and lambda particles and so on, these things are just the spatialized representation of the amplitudehedron. So it gives us a very powerful way of predicting particle physics, but it does so by pointing by, by first having us admit that the particles are not actually materially real objects, that what we're seeing as particles are simply these structures that show up, or these these um, kind of icons that show up in space-time, which is itself not even real. And what it's actually referring to is this structure that is deeper than physical space-time. So that's what particle physics tells us today. And then if we go over to quantum gravity, it gives us the exact same picture from yet another angle. And this is important because this is the, kind of the, the last area that physics would study. This is not quantum mechanics or particle physics. This is the nature of space-time, which deals with relativity and so on. So quantum gravity, which would subsume general relativity when it's completed, tells us that space time is emergent, or alternately, that space is an illusion. And specifically, it now tells us that space emerges from entangled quantum information, which is something we get from things like the ER equals EPR correspondence. Now, before you say something like, well, quantum gravity is not a consensus yet, we have all these different competing approaches, and we don't know which one's right, and so we don't know, we can't really say anything about quantum gravity yet, let me direct your attention to this quote from George Musser, who was a planetary scientist and mathematician. There are almost as many contending ideas for a quantum theory of gravity as scientists working on the topic. The disputes obscure an important truth. The competing approaches all say space is derived from something deeper, an idea that breaks with 2,500 years of scientific and philosophic understanding. And then from Eleanor Knox, who is a philosopher of physics, there aren't many things in quantum gravity that everyone agrees on. Yet the one thing many people seem to agree on in quantum gravity is that we are going to have to cope with space and time not being fundamental. So that's what the physics is telling us from quantum gravity. Now this, of course, meshes very well with the non-locality discovery in quantum mechanics, which is what the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was about. Uh, locality, of course, defines space. So, for example, if I'm touching something here and looking at it as though it's here, it doesn't make any sense to say that it's also way over there. Locality is the notion that something is close to us depending, uh, defined by our ability to interact with it. If we can interact with it as though it's nearby, then it's nearby, and if we have to interact with it as though it's very far away, it's very far away. Like, if we can't interact with it very much, it's very far away. Well, non-locality uh, points out that that's not true. We can just interact with stuff even though it's very far away. And so if that's the case, the whole notion of defining uh, here versus over there, it completely breaks down. The whole notion of how we know that something is in one location rather than another uh, is based on locality, and quantum mechanics is telling us that reality is not local. And so basically when we collapse the wave function, it looks like it's local, we have this kind of computer game environment we're living in. But the reality of it is, is that it's not actually physically there. Um, and then the, the, the real reality is this sort of kind of hard drive reality beneath all of that, which is completely non-spatial. And of course, if space is an illusion, matter is too. And then when someone says, well, if you just proven matter, then uh, you're going to go get the Nobel Prize in physics for it, right? And so you should come back and, and say when you've done that. Well, I can't because that's what the 2022 Nobel Prize was for. Anton Selinger already got the Nobel Prize for exactly that discovery. So yeah, this is this is science now. This is the... The best science there is when it comes to telling us what atoms in the void are, and it tells us that neither exists. So it's all an illusion, and that's the, the first mind bomb, basically. You're not living in the world you think you are. You think you're living in this material world, and maybe if you're a dualist, you think there's all this, also this little dollop of supernaturalism thrown on top of it, and that, that all that's completely wrong. It's You're living in a, a matrix-type environment instead. 
Now you might balk at all this and say, well, is this really what the science is saying? Like, I, I have a hard time believing this, right? Well, it is saying this, and not only is it saying this, but the fact that it's saying this has actually been picked up upon by philosophers of science who are actually scrambling now to try to avoid this as a conclusion. It's really funny, actually. You have people like Nina Emery who are saying, we need to reject wave function realism because it leads to radical metaphysics such as Bostrom simulism, matrix style brain and vast scenarios, or idealism. And so, you know, she's admitting here that, you know, you actually have physics that is leading to these sorts of conclusions, and we have to find a way to treat this physics instrumentally. We, we can't actually believe the physics because if we believe the physics is literally true, we end up with radical metaphysics. And so, yeah, not only are they admitting this, but um, they're actually trying to reject, find ways to reject the science simply to it, keep admitting, you know, to keep away from the conclusion, basically. And so now, don't don't actually tell her this, but uh, that doesn't work either, because in 2011, they found that the wave function was real with another experiment as well. So you actually have to reject even more science simply to hold that view. So, yes, this is what the science is actually telling us. I know we want to live in a, want to believe we live in a common sense material world, but that's not what the science is saying. Uh, maybe maybe you want to live in a common sense material world with a, a supernaturalism thrown on top of it if you're a dualist, but that's also not what we're living on. What we're living in is more like a matrix environment, and that's simply the best picture the science has for us right now. Now, how does consciousness fit into all of this? Well, we already know that materialism does not work to account for it. Uh, materialism has this thing called the hard problem, which, as I pointed out before, is in principle insoluble, it cannot be solved due to the explanatory gap. You have uh, third person um, material properties which are irreducible, and somehow those would have to give rise to first person mental properties which are also irreducible, and you can't derive unlike properties from unlike properties. And strong emergence fails for the same reason. It simply says that if you make the, uh, the third person properties complex enough, then somehow at some level of complexity, consciousness will just poof out of it like magic, even though you literally, you cannot predict how that would happen from a third-person material substrate. So that that should really be seen as a pathology in much the way that, say, tachyons or you know, singularities are seen as a pathology in a physics model. If your cognitive science model gives you back strong emergence, that is a sign you did something wrong, because that is that's literally getting first-person properties out of something where they, they can't derive. You can't derive first-person properties from just making third-person properties super complex. There's, there's nothing that bridges the explanatory gap there. So, consciousness, therefore, has to be fundamental. It cannot be emergent. If it's not emergent, then by definition, it's fundamental. The problem is, is that we discovered before, that space-time is not fundamental, which means that consciousness has to be more fundamental than space-time. Now, when we go over to the science on this, we actually discover something that matches this very neatly. There's this thing called quantum cognition, which models fuzzy logic and indecision in decision-making behavior. For example, if you go to a freezer door and your favorite ice cream is vanilla, your second favorite is chocolate, you might waffle between the two for a while before settling upon one or the other, right? Now, if you're a robot, you wouldn't do that. You just calculate which one you want and then immediately shut the freezer door. But you stand there and you waffle for a while before picking one of the freezer. And it turns out this is more than an accident. This actually, this waffling behavior exactly matches uh, the Schrodinger equation. You actually model your thoughts during this process as though they were wave functions. And when you look at uh, integrated information theory or conscious realism, they tell you something uh, that matches this very neatly. They tell you that consciousness equals entanglement. Integrated information theory says that uh, Entanglement is integrated information uh, because you can't treat two, two of the, um, the elements separately. They are, they're treated as like the same system and therefore they are, by definition, integrated. And then in conscious realism, you have the same conclusion, just a different way around. Uh, Hoffman derived an equation for consciousness on his model and he found that it was the same as the free particle wave function. So consciousness is entanglement. That's what our, our the best theory now says. And then you have um, experiments that kind of match this. There are the lithium and xenon isotope experiments that are conducted on rats. And of course, the same isotopes, uh, or, or rather different isotopes of the same elements should behave the same if it's just chemical properties. 
Now, different isotopes have the exact same chemical properties, as long as they are the same element. So it shouldn't affect the brain at all if the brain is just a classical system, and yet, surprise, surprise, it does. For example, if you give a rat lithium-6, and then you give another rat lithium-7, they'll have completely different maternal instincts in their cognitive behavior. And then likewise with anesthesia, they actually found that um, you can use xenon to induce anesthesia, and but the, the, the efficacy of the anesthetic is dependent on the the quantum spin of the particular xenon isotope you give it. And they had like four different isotopes they tested and I think ones with the odd spin number produce one effect and those with the even spin number produce a different effect in regards to anesthesia. And lastly, we have the Trinity University experiment in Dublin from 2022. And this was uh, particularly interesting because this directly correlated entanglement for the first time with conscious activity. They have an MRI machine that was able to uh, scan for proton spin in your brain water and specifically entangled sp proton spin. And they found that it matched your EEG reading, which is, you know, records your consciousness. And so whatever the EEG is reading, which is correlated to your consciousness in your brain, is exactly correlated to the entangled proton spin in your brain water. And so this is actually impossible unless whatever is correlated to your consciousness in your brain is also entangled to the proton spin. So whatever the consciousness is located in, in your brain is actually part of an entangled system with the proton spin. Uh, no, let's say, for example, that it wasn't, it was just interacting with the entangled system of the proton spin. Well, then it would immediately collapse the wave function of the proton spin. And then you would no, have no, longer, no longer have any entanglement and that would be, um, yeah, there would be no entanglement anymore. So therefore, the very fact that your EEG is matched to the entanglement of the proton spin in the brain water tells us that your consciousness is actually in the entanglement of the proton spin. And so that's our picture right now. We have quantum gravity, space that emerges from entanglement, and then from this quantum cognition stuff, we find that consciousness is quantum entanglement. So therefore, we now have a complete physics picture of space time emerging from quantum entanglement, which is consciousness. And so that's kind of the best picture we have in regards to physics now. So what new picture of metaphysics does this give us? Well, it tells us that the universe is mental rather than material. Namely, idealism is true. And then in turn, that idealist reality emerges from a deeper reality of wave functions, aka Hilbert space. Quantum cognition then equates these wave functions with introspective mental states. Most of this is, of course, going to be inaccessible to us, lying in our subconscious, but we could call it a shared inner space, which is roughly what Jung probably thought of as the uh, collective unconscious. And then space-time would then emerge from this shared inner space, as is shown in Inspiring Philosophy's little clip on this in the background. And then, of course, um, if the outer world emerges from the inner world, then what goes on in the inner world is going to correspond to what goes on in the outer world and vice versa. And then lastly, the spatial projection of these wave functions in space-time manifests as quantum vibrations. Remember uh, Michio Kaku's waves of vibration? Well, these would then replicate the illusion of the material world, which would include space-time, matter, and energy, and all that would be the result of these quantum vibrations. In other words, essentially quantum idealism. Now this allows for a wider range of possibilities though, including what you might otherwise call extraordinary claims. You know, in naive realism, be that materialism or dualism, you have a much more constrained concept of the possible. Something that is ordinary in the aforementioned idealist paradigm may be extraordinary in a materialist or a dualist paradigm. And as Shakespeare pointed out, uh, you know, there are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, and you might call those things extraordinary. But the point is that they could very easily be dreamt of in the aforementioned framework. They're not really extraordinary there anymore. Now, what's interesting is they do show up in the dualist framework, but when they show up in the dualist framework, they are actually seen as extraordinary. They're simply accepted as extraordinary and called miracles. And so well, the materialist framework then says, well, they're extraordinary, therefore we reject them. The dualist framework calls them extraordinary and says, therefore we're going to accept them as miracles, and usually only if they appear in our religion and not anywhere else, not in mythology, not in any of their claim. But the idealist framework is saying, well, no, that's simply 
one other thing that happens in our reality. It's kind of to be expected as a consequence of our metaphysics that this kind of thing happens sometimes. And it fits in and is explained very neatly by this metaphysics. Now you might say that whether or not something is extraordinary is not its ability to be plausibly conceived of given a certain framework of reality, but rather how rarely it occurs. However, this is not really the case. To illustrate, it would be useful to look at our first set of claims deemed to be extraordinary, namely those of parapsychology, though this would probably only be like a 1 or a 2 on the extraordinariness meter. So there are these institutes that study psi, namely parapsychological activity, and they publish papers on their findings and oftentimes they report high sigma in their experiments. Now of course, skeptics find this to be extraordinary and are thus skeptical of it. However, here's an example of a famous neuropsychologist named Donald Hebb who is one of these skeptics and he makes the source of his skepticism obvious in the following quote. Why do we not accept ESP as psychological fact? Ryan has offered enough evidence to have convinced us on almost any other issue. Personally, I do not accept ESP for a moment, because, because it does not make sense. My external criteria, both of physics and of physiology, say that ESP is not a fact despite the behavioral evidence that has been reported. I cannot see what other basis my colleagues have for rejecting it. Ryan may still turn out to be right, improbable as I think that is, and my own rejection of it of, of his view is, in the literal sense, prejudice. So this is actually, this kind of thing is actually commonplace in um, psi research as well as uh, skepticism of psi research. So for example, there are other high sigma claims. And again, that does not mean that the research is necessarily valid. I mean, that they're claiming it's high sigma. I'm not claiming that, but this is what's being reported. And these are reported from people like Dean Radin or Roger Nelson. And um, if these are happening, like if they are right, and I'm not saying they are, but if they're right, then this psi is actually happening at like a, at a small scale all the time. So it's not something that is you know, a rare thing. It's literally something that's happening all the time right in our noses. So now looking back at Donald Hebb's reasoning here, his issue is not lack of evidence because if what they're claiming is true, then the evidence is happening all the time, right? Um, rather, the issue is his limited conceptions of what physics and physiology can do. Now, whether or not the psi actually is real, a quantum idealist framework could very easily account for something like this. Of course, that doesn't make it real, but it does make it plausible. If it was real, that wouldn't actually be too much of a surprise. And by the way, this sort of thing, this sort of interaction between parapsychology and skepticism of parapsychology, apparently it's a, a commonplace thing. Uh, for example, there was a, a paper by Dean Radin where he, he publishes this, and a journal publishes it, and he gets positive feedback on it. Later on, they redact the paper, and they're like, he messages them and says, why did you redact this? And he said, like, was, it, was it my data? And said, no, it's not your data. Was it your methods? No. Was it your you know experimental setup? No. No, no, no. And then finally they come back and say, you can keep your paper as is, and we'll publish it under the exception that you change the end of the paper to the conclusion that psi can't possibly be real. And so right there, you know, I, I'm not, you know, an expert qualified to like judge how they judge these experiments and all that. But the point is, is that the, the journal itself was not able to find, and that's the journal claiming this, was not able to find a problem with his research. Rather, their, their motivation or their reasoning for this was simply a question-begging motivation to have the conclusion be false. And so, now again, that doesn't make it real, but the point is, is that this is data that comes in all the time that they essentially just rejected because they thought it was extraordinary, even though it was apparently, you know, what they believed to be commonplace, essentially. I'm not saying that that's what they are kind of admitting by, you know, saying there's nothing wrong with his, his research. So this this happens all the time, and the the issue is not, you know, the data or the lack of it or the um, how often it happens, but rather it very much has to do with one's metaphysics and how one defines the sense of the possible. And this leads into the second problem, which has to do with how the dualist versus materialist dialectic constrains our sense of the possible. Materialism, and for that matter dualism, are obviously completely wrong but everyone thinks that they are true due to baseless pre-programmed intuitions about naive realism. 
So starting from that framework, you find a parallel between an extraordinary claim in the Bible and something in myth, and what do you do? Basically, you are left with a false dichotomy. Either extraordinary claims are real, but they are only real in our religion, and not in your religion, and not outside of religion either, and of course they also have to be inexplicable. Science can't explain it, we can't even use metaphysics to explain it, it has to be pixie dust that did it. Or you're left with the conclusion that the claim is not real, but rather is based on some myth that it resembles. Well, starting from that position, given the parallel with the myth, of course you're going to reach the conclusion that it is derived from myth instead. For example, going from your video on the Gospels, Jesus is the Son of God who ascends into the clouds. Romulus, meanwhile, is the son of a god, namely Mars, who likewise ascends into the clouds. We don't believe the Romulus story, and I think most Christians would agree with you on that, and so when we find the parallel to Jesus, the logical conclusion becomes that it was more likely that they adopted this from the Romulus myth, than that the extraordinary claim that Jesus ascended into the clouds is true. Ergo, the Gospels are mythical, or semi-mythical, as you conclude. There is, however, a third option. However, before we get to that, I need to draw your attention to a completely different extraordinary claim. This is a modern extraordinary claim, rather than an ancient one, and it is also a religious extraordinary claim, just not a Christian one. Specifically, it comes from the religion of Thelema, namely the religion started by Aleister Crowley. The claim is that Crowley used sorcery to contact a non-human intelligence called Lamb. Well, on face value, this sounds like crazy talk, right? So how is this claim to work? Let's say you go to an occult practitioner and you ask them, how do we do this? Well, they're going to respond with something by pointing to something called sigil magic, and specifically they're going to point you to Goetia, and well, how does Goetia work? Well, the idea is, is you focus on a sigil, maybe do some little, you know, ritual or something with that, and then due to the operation of an occult metaphysics, this enables you to mentally communicate with the entity in question that the sigil is correlated with. Well now, I'm going to drop a second mind bomb. The metaphysical picture I just gave you before is a radical metaphysics. But it's not just any kind of radical metaphysics. Rather, it's a very specific kind of radical metaphysics. So let's overview it again. If the mind exists and cannot be reduced to matter, and if substance dualism is false, then no other substance exists. Thus we conclude, all is mind, the universe is a mental construct. The scientific evidence points to the fact that space, time, and matter are emergent from the wave function in Hilbert space. In the inner world of consciousness and mind can be modeled as Hilbert space in the study of quantum cognition. Add on the evidence for quantum mind theory, and the most parsimonious explanation is space-time emerges from a shared inner mental world. And these wave functions from which physical space-time and its contents arise are, as Michio Kaku would put it, They're waves. Waves of vibration. Before I reveal what this is, does anyone have any guess what this might be? It's been sort of an open secret with some people on my channel, so some people here might know. Anyway, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and tell me what you think this is in the comments. Or if you don't know, just say so as well. And then unpause the video. Okay, now pause. So, in addition to being the sort of picture of reality that you see on my channel or IP's channel, this is something that is called Hermetic Metaphysics. Uh, this here is the principle of mentalism. Thus we conclude, all is mind, the universe is a mental construct. The principle of mentalism is the first of the seven Hermetic principles. The all is mind, the universe is mental as quoted by the Kabbalion. Then we have the principle of correspondence, which you can see here in IP's video. The outer world emerges from the inner world and thus corresponds to it. The hermetic principle of correspondence goes as follows. As above, so below. As below, so above. As within, so without. And as without, so within. The scientific evidence points to the fact that space, time, and matter are emergent from the wave function in Hilbert space. In the inner world of consciousness and mind can be modeled as Hilbert space in the study of quantum cognition. Add on the evidence for quantum mind theory, and the most parsimonious explanation is space-time emerges from a shared inner mental world. As within, so without, 
as the universe, so the soul. This quote belongs to Hermes Trismegistus and it's from the Emerald Tablets. The ancient principle of this quote encapsulates the profound concept of macrocosm and microcosm. This philosophical and metaphysical idea suggests that there exists a deep interconnection and correspondence between the larger universe, known as the macrocosm, and the individual, referred to as the microcosm. The principle implies that the same patterns, structures, and laws governing the vast cosmos are reflected in the smaller systems, such as human beings and their experiences. This correlates to what a few scientists have recently published, where they point out that there are interesting similarities between neural networks and the cosmic web of galaxies. Recently, astrophysicist Franco Vaza and neurosurgeon Alberto Folletti wrote an article on the similarities between both. Is the apparent similarity just a human tendency to perceive meaningful patterns in random data? Remarkably enough, the answer seems to be no. Statistical analysis shows these systems do indeed present quantitative similarities. They note the similarities line up with information processing, power spectrum analysis, total neuron to total observable galaxies, and in many other ways. And then lastly, we have the principle of vibration. The scientific evidence points to the fact that space, time, and matter are emergent from the wave function in Hilbert space. And these wave functions from which physical space, time, and its contents arise are, as Michio Kaku would put it, they're waves, waves of vibration. The great third hermetic principle, the principle of vibration. Nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. Well, there's more to it, but this is the core of it. The other ones can kind of derive from this or maybe derive from it with a, a few small other assumptions being added in. Well, what is this? It's not the metaphysics of most Christian apologists. It may be of IP and others I influenced, but it's not the metaphysics of your average Christian apologist, or for that matter, your average Catholic Christian apologist, or of William Lane Craig or Thomas Aquinas. Though in fairness, Thomas are a little closer to some of his conclusions in a few regards. Also, it's not the metaphysics of Democritus, Richard Dawkins, your favorite new atheist, or doubting Thomas. No, this is the metaphysics of Simon the Sorcerer, Manly P. Hall, Dr. Strange, Balthazar from The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and Aleister Crowley. There is actually an entire book on this called The Quantum Hermetica that goes into much greater detail. Essentially, they argue in a step-by-step -step manner that quantum idealism or conscious realism entirely replicates Hermeticism and they purport physics parallels to that effect. I am going to issue another disclaimer at this point though. The metaphysical part of this is apparently the same. The fact that everything is made of vibrations, aka wave functions, that these vibrations are mental and produce the illusion of materiality, as well as space, could just be a coincidence or a lucky guess. The other two points of this, though, could be deduced from metaphysics, namely idealism and correspondence. I'm personally not going any farther than that for a reason, however. The Palmers, who are the ones who wrote the Quantum Hermetica, do go farther with the parallels, though. Actually, substantially farther. I made a video on this some time back called the Kabbalion's Vibration Enigma, which I slapped a big disclaimer on the front of. You can go check that out in the description if you want. They do make an interesting case. Um, there's actually a lot of physics parallels they make. However, I'm not uh, touching the inclusion of this with a 10-foot pole as it is literally radioactive. So I'm not defending the parallels beyond what entails the metaphysics and the basic statement about vibration which, while it does happen to be physics, could also just be a lucky guess. Now, before you think otherwise, it's not actually woo as I originally feared when it was being passed around on the idealism and science versus atheism board some years ago, as the claims it makes are too precise. It's, it's a very scientific type of argument. Now, of course, it could be wrong, their argument could be wrong, but it's it's a, a very precise argument with very precise, you know, claims in it, and uh, that's not, you know, that's not what woo is, where woo is just garbledygook sounding stuff that doesn't uh, doesn't actually match any scientific claims. So they do actually know their subject matter, and the book is very heavily referenced with 172 citations for a 100-page book, if you want to go check it out. And I, I include that in the description, too, if you want. So before we continue, I'm not making all the claims the Palmers make about the physics parallels. 
I'm also not claiming all the associated occult phenomena that often go along with such a framework. I'm just saying its metaphysical framework happens to be how reality is set up. One could in theory have that framework without any of the associated paranormal or supernatural type claims though. But now here's the thing. The entire reason we would call such claims such as for example Crowley communicating with Lamb as being extraordinary or crazy is because our sense of what constitutes extraordinary is defined by naive realist metaphysics, be that either materialist or dualist. Whereas in reality, when we go all the way down to investigate the physics, what we find is that the world we thought was a materialist world is actually a high order approximation of an entirely different world. And not only does that world have a radical metaphysics, but it also has precisely the sort of radical metaphysics one would expect if something like ritual occult magic or contacting non-human entities also happen to be real. Of course, I'm not saying any of that also is real. It could just be that the structure of reality is such that it just so happens to coincide with a world wherein all of that stuff is real. But it does open the possibility for it. Well now, at this point, even if you were to adopt this metaphysical picture of reality, you might be inclined to say something like, well yes, but come on Johannan, what is the probability of that being real anyway? Like at this point, this is just going crazy. Isn't it much more likely that this is just modern mythology? Well here's the thing with that. You might be tempted to assign a probability to this and have that probability be quite low. But the truth is, you don't actually know that. The probability might be close to zero, but it also might be actually very high. So the problem is that we're in completely uncharted territory here. On an old map, this is where they would say something like, a, here be dragons. Because of this, we don't know what's on their side of this that could possibly influence that probability. And there could be something that actually raises that probability substantially. So we can't prognosticate one way or the other. We need to be agnostic. Worse, it's set up exactly as you would expect if all of those things that go bump in the night were real. And that's just a kind of freakish coincidence. And then of course we have countless accounts of people reporting these sorts of things throughout history. You know, this is a common facet of the human experience and uh, this is not the first time someone reported this and it's certainly not going to be the last time. Believe it or not, uh, Jack Parsons, who is the guy who founded the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, actually reported this. He was a friend of Crowley's and, um, you know, he knew about this stuff and he believed it. Let's look at an example here using this metaphysics to account for what we might call a paranormal or extraordinary claim. Let's imagine that Crowley's lamb was real and let's use the aforementioned framework to figure out how to contact him slash it slash whatever it is. How would you do it? Well, recall that Donald Hoffman has a type of quantum idealist model called conscious realism, wherein reality is comprised of conscious agents. And he posits that we see reality through what he calls icon interfaces. He even says that some of these conscious agents are completely non-spatial and could live completely beyond our physical space-time without even having an icon interface in our space-time. The theory of conscious agents allows for the existence of conscious agents in which they have no interface at all. There are, there are simple agents that literally have conscious experiences and nothing like space-time, nothing like particles at all. Just merely conscious experiences without that format. So, so, pan so I think that certain conscious agents may answer to the kind of thing that panpsychists like Galen Strassen are talking about. But, but my theory allows that there is a more a wider variety of conscious agents in which there is nothing like a space-time. There is nothing like microphysical particles at all. Um, and, and nothing that would answer to the, our ideas about a physicalist. Um, you know, so, a dual, so the dual aspect monism, I'm claiming that there could be conscious agents for which the, like, what we call the physical side of that dual aspect monism just isn't there. So the real reality then is what is behind physical space-time and that is composed of conscious agents. Conscious agents in turn have associated icon interfaces in space-time and so you could entangle with such a conscious agent by entangling with its associated icon. We know that our interface has portals into the realm of conscious agents. If we understood our interface well enough and how it interacts with this realm of conscious agents, could we develop technology to rejig our interface to open up new portals into the realm of conscious agents? We should be able to reverse engineer this whole process and open up new portals. 
in this version of it, we wouldn't be creating new consciousnesses. We would be using technology to open up new portals into conscious agents that are already there. And that may be a Pandora's box. I mean, my theory doesn't entail that all those conscious agents are going to be nice to us. <laughs> I don't know. So the real reality then is what is behind physical space time, and that is composed of conscious agents. Conscious agents in turn have associated icon interfaces in space time, and so you could entangle with such a conscious agent by entangling with its associated icon. And that is how you would contact it. I actually did a video exploring this as a hypothetical possibility some time back. It's the autonomous agents video in the description if you're curious. But there was something I didn't actually mention about that in the video. Well, so let's just change the word icon interface into the word symbol or sigil, and you then get back the exact mechanism as well as its accompanying metaphysics that is what is described by a magic system called Goetia. So now suppose there is no paranormal, no lamb, no demons, etc. You still get back the exact means that is purported to be used to contact them as an actual consequence of this picture. Meaning the proverbial telephone for these things is exactly as it would be given what we know of reality if all of that just happened to be real. And well, that's just plain spooky. That sort of coincidence is, is really actually eerie if you think about it. Crown, Mr. Hammond, the phones are working. A little disclaimer here, uh, don't go play with this stuff. Just because I'm explaining how it could hypothetically work doesn't mean I'm, I'm advocating for anyone to go and play with this, just in case something does happen to pick up on the other side of the telephone. I showed this stuff to another guy named Matthew Ferguson, who you might actually know Derek. He was an accomplished atheist himself. He's uh, actually a historical counter-apologist. He published with Graham Oppie, who's a very famous philosophic atheist, and debated Mike Lacona's son-in-law. But I told him not to play with it. Um, but it turns out, a year later, he comes back to me, and apparently uh, curiosity got the best of him, and the long story short, the good news is that he is now questioning the possibility of the existence of the paranormal and atheism. The bad news is why, and let me just say that you're probably much happier not knowing. Um, so just in case the probability that there is something on the other side of the proverbial telephone happens to be higher rather than lower, don't play around with the proverbial telephone. I'm not advocating that anyone play around with that stuff just to make everything perfectly clear here. So anyway, the larger point I'm making here is that you might be tempted to apply your methodology to the lamb story and call this an example of modern mythology. And maybe you might say something like, this was based on the older legend of Faust contacting Mephistopheles, or someone contacting a djinn, etc. And see, they clearly both use sigils to do so. So obviously, that was something from an older account being grafted into the lamb story. Well, it might be. Or it might just be real. And all the other stories that you might be inclined to label as myth and suggest that it borrowed from them, well, those might be real as well. Why? Because the sort of reality you live in is such that things like this just might be real. I mean, possibly not as well. I'm certainly not saying that they definitely are real. But what I'm pointing out is that the metaphysical framework is such that it doesn't limit this. If those things turn out to be real, there would be a very ready explanation for them. And so this is not extraordinary as it would be on materialism. It might be extraordinary in terms of it not happening very often, but it's not extraordinary in the sense of it being impossible to conceive of or something that is completely alien to our categories of explanation. Now, applying this to religious supernatural claims in Christianity, it changes things. Your average Christian is coming at this from a dualist framework, meaning they think this was done by magic in the pejorative sense of the word, the fairies in pixie dust sense of the word, not the metaphysical occult sense of the word that I described before. Uh, furthermore, they also think that our supernatural claims are real and everyone else's isn't. And this in turn skews their epistemology. They think that our supernatural claims are true because our religion is true. Meaning not the evidence for the miracles which tells us they're true, but rather the reason behind them. In other words, they think that our miracles prove our religion. And so when you think like that, you end up with this dichotomy where you end up with parochial religion-specific magic versus the generic grafting of mythology claims into the text, which is what a lot of the arguments on your channel revolve around. This is exactly the wrong way to argue for religious supernatural claims. 
If religion is true, its supernatural claims are true because they are the consequence of an underlying metaphysics. This is not magical power. It is called a gun and it is a machine. Behold! The magical power that belongs to your God! I give you this gun! I give you the world! What's wrong? I don't know. Fix it. It's a machine. I can make it work and so can you, just like Jamal there can fire that staff. Now I'll show you how. And furthermore, to the extent that religion is true or untrue is actually the extent to which its doctrines reflect metaphysics and not the other way around. No, things are not true because the Bible says so, but rather things in the Bible are true because they reflect things in objective reality. Uh, this is the whole point behind the correspondence theory of truth, and too often in religion, I see people flipping this epistemology on its head. So now, if religion is true, we should expect the world to be such that supernatural events like this happen as a natural course, as a consequence of this underlying metaphysics, which I just pointed out before is actually the metaphysics that our world works by. So supernatural occurrences then only get incorporated into the religion after the fact. You know, the supernatural occurrence is the primary reality, that is the thing the truth corresponds to, and then you have the true claim, which is what is corresponding to the actual reality. And so the supernatural event is primary, as well as the metaphysics, which is based on its primary, and then religion is a reflection of that truth. Realizing this changes your methodology. Your average Christian will want to argue that only Christian miracle claims are true, and everyone else's is mythology. And of course, the atheist comeback to that is that Christian miracle claims are mythology too. The idea being that similarities between Christian miracle claims and others mean that Christian claims are based on those other claims rather than being real. What I'm saying is that no, you're both wrong. They might all be real because they are consequences of an underlying metaphysical reality that allows for such things in the first place. There's actually an example that applies to Christianity here that comes from Dzogchen, which is a particular sect of Tibetan Buddhism. They have this concept called the rainbow body, which has some resemblances to the Christian concept of the resurrection body. Uh, supposedly people who have this or attain this, they can dissolve their body, like dematerialize it at will and become like purely spiritual beings or whatnot. And this happens like right after death or something like this with some monks. And supposedly there is modern evidence of this. I was given this by a, a book by a friend on this that was written by a Catholic priest called Francis Tiso. It's called Rainbow Body and Resurrection. And well, most Christians would reject it. And now suppose it predated Christianity rather than postdated. Well, you might say, well, no, Christianity incorporated the resurrection body from Zogzen mythology. It's all just a myth. Well, you wouldn't know that, and they wouldn't know that it isn't real either. And I'm not saying it is real. But the point is, is that if that's real, if those claims are real, and, and the recent claim that was made supposedly comes from as recently as 1999, which is what this guy's book was based on, uh, this actually cranks up the probability of the resurrection body. And so if you have a, an underlying metaphysics that explains all this, you know, this would actually raise the probability of certain miracle claims in Christianity. Not because, you know, Christianity is the only one with the miracles in it, but rather because these miracles are things that happen. You know, if there are similar miracles in other places, they happen. And therefore, the ones in Christianity then become more likely to be true as well. So your next question, I would imagine, would be, well, why Christianity then? Why not just this underlying metaphysics? You know, why don't we just go, say, spiritual but not religious? That is a great question, but there's far too much material involved in that to address here. That would require a whole other video to unpack. In a nutshell, though, what you'd want to do is have it creedally based rather than dogma based. So in other words, in trying to, say, take all the statements in the Bible and prove each one of them true independently, you take a creed, like, say, the Nicene Creed, plus maybe a little bit more, that makes you know Christianity uniquely Christian, and you go through and try and ground each one of those doctrines metaphysically. And I have a way of doing this, but once again, that's far too much material for this video. 
So back to our current topic, though. If you are going to argue for Christian miracle claims, you want a metaphysical picture of reality that would result in such claims, with or without religion being attached to them. Now let's look at one of the claims you brought up before in your Gospels video. You point out that Romulus ascends in a cloud, and of course Romulus is the son of a god, namely Mars, and of course Jesus also was claimed to have ascended in a cloud, and Jesus is the son of God. Hence the idea is that the Gospel accounts borrowed from the Romulus narrative. Well, how would the aforementioned methodology I bring up make this different? Well, it might suggest that uh, this whole disappearing in a cloud thing is actually some reference to a observation of some kind of phenomenon. And so what is claimed here is that you go into another realm by way of a cloud. And if this is real, you know, as, as a hypothetical, this would be a consequence of metaphysics, meaning this is not a religion-specific miracle, this is simply something that happens in reality, albeit, you know, paranormal reality or whatnot. And if that is true, it would show up several times. So that's the question. Does it actually show up several times? Well, actually, it turns out that it does. Uh, there is an island um, in Irish mythology called High Brazil that is said to disappear. It's not actually on the map. like they, they, They've had them on maps before, but you go there and it's just seawater. But people claim that it, according to Irish mythology, that the island appears out of a cloud every so often, and then disappears into a cloud again. And then, of course, we have uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann, also this from like Celtic mythology, which it's something Irish as well. And they have this thing, they, they, they're said to have appeared out of a cloud when they first showed up. And they also have this thing called the Feth Fieta, which is a, a magical mist, or veil in Irish mythology, and they just disappear into this mist. And then, of course, in the Old Testament, we have this thing called the Shekinah, which is a cloud of light that appears around God. So now, is there anything in this metaphysics that can account for something like, say, other realms? Well, it turns out that there is. This comes from the Quantum Hermetica, and they cite Eric Verlin's research on emergent space-time as a proposed explanation for dark matter. Here they say the gravitational influence associated with dark matter actually derives from the vibrations of underlying degrees of freedom coming from beneath emergent space-time. This is, of course, math speak for other universes existing in other frequency domains of Hilbert space. And so the idea then is that what we're calling dark matter is actually just the gravitational influence, like I think of it like shadow gravity, coming from these other universes behind emergent space-time. This would be similar to MWI, but whereas MWI treats the universes as differing by phase relations, this would have them differ by frequency. So if you think of MWI as universes on the AM dial on your radio, this would be universes on the FM dial. And now when we switch over to comparative religion, we actually find something like this in Hinduism. Hinduism has this concept called the loka, or lokas, which are other vibrational planes that exist separately from ours, and this uh, they, they fit into their idealistic metaphysics, which of course, once again, fits very neatly into Hermetic Metaphysics, which, as I pointed out before, is actually the same metaphysical framework as Quantum Idealism. So now, while we're off speculating on this topic, what about portals to other realms showing up in comparative mythology? Well, check out this Native American claim. And again, I'm not saying any of this is real, but we're just playing with this idea. This place is often called, you know, the a Disneyland of the paranormal or the Area 51 of the paranormal because it's got literally everything. So in the last few decades alone, people have claimed to see UFOs and other aerial phenomenon. Um, they've seen portals open up into the sky. It's more interesting to me, especially in terms of what people say goes on at Skinwalker Ranch, are these little swirly things. Um, People interpret these to be portals opening up to other worlds, and the youths and the Navajo both believe in being able to travel between different dimensions or different worlds. I mean, here's more. Go ahead and pause to look at these. This one is super interesting to me because it looks like, you know, there's a portal right there and something over here and then something coming out of the portal. Um, yeah, go ahead and take a long look at this one. Uh, thank you to Ellie Lycona for that little clip. Now, if you notice, what the cave painting describes actually looks pretty similar to the spiral phenomenon, 
reported in the skies above Norway some years back, and reports of similar phenomena around the world. Now, in some cases, this can be easily explained by rockets whose guidance system went off, and the rocket began to spiral around, and other people have suggested some of this might be some sort of auroral effect. However, some of these are not so easy to explain. The one in Norway, for instance, was apparently many miles across, which you obviously couldn't attribute to a rocket. And then there is the more out there claim that this is a portal of some kind. Of course, I'm not saying that is necessarily the case, and that would very much count as what you might call modern mythology. However, if you play with that idea, it does seem to fit well with what the Native American claim is portraying. And during daytime, that would look kind of like a cloud. So who knows? And speaking of modern mythology, let's look at the topic of UFOs for a moment. These are being discussed in seriousness in Congress right now, so maybe they are not as crazy as we might have thought. Well, some reports describe UFOs disappearing like ghosts. You have it on radar or video camera one second, and the next it just seemingly blinks out of existence. And then when you get to some of the more lurid claims, you have people who claim to have actually been on board some of these craft, and they say that the craft is made to shift vibration, and then phases out of our plane of reality. Uh, when they travel, they travel by shifting their vibrations and frequencies. All they have to do is raise the vibration of the craft. It's like watching a fan blade or a propeller on a plane. When it speeds up, it becomes invisible. That's what happens with them. When they speed up the vibration and frequency of the craft, it will disappear into the other dimension. People have reported seeing a light in the sky will suddenly blink out. And other times they'll see one just appear. That's when they slow down the vibration to come into our atmosphere. However, it does have a suspicious similarity to the Hindu local concept I described earlier. I mean, that is literally what that would be, a plane on another frequency. And so if any of these claims like these about UFOs were to happen to be true, it would then raise the prior for such things as Hindu lokas or the concept of other realms in general immediately. So now let's look at more modern mythos. Specifically, let's see if we can find anything in this category that overlaps with older mythology regarding other realms of existence and maybe even clouds forming entrances to these other realms. It looked like a luminous cloud coming from the north and making a wide arc to approach from the south while descending lower and lower. The buzzing sound became louder and louder. When the cloud stopped, we saw that it was rotating. The cloud consisted of a reddish gray fog which seemed to pulsate with a strange light, while wisps of smoke rose from its upper surface. We both stood still without saying a word. The cloud came slowly towards us, and when it was at about 50 feet, we saw that inside the cloud, there was a shiny metal vessel about 10 feet in diameter. The fog thickened more and more, and we could not see each other even though we were only six feet apart. The fog finally became so thick that the creature could not be seen either. Suddenly, the beam of light on the ground melted together, floated upwards like a flickering flame, and was sucked into the opening of the craft. Then, it was as if the fog curtain was torn apart, and the air above us was empty. If you notice here, the description of the craft appearing and then disappearing in a fog, even has a striking similarity to the concept seen in Irish mythology of the Tuatha de Danann disappearing in the Feth Fiata, or Magical Mist. This isn't the only time this shows up either. This thing regarding fog creating a portal shows up as a pattern in other people's accounts as well. Few have lived to tell of any strange anomalies that have occurred to them in the Bermuda Triangle. But American pilot Bruce Gernon is an exception. In 1970, Gernon, his father and a business associate were flying from the Bahamas to Florida when Gernon reported seeing a strange cloud directly out in front of their plane. Then, as he approached, Gernon claims the cloud formed a donut-shaped hole, or vortex. The tunnel was huge at first, but then it started getting smaller rapidly. And when I penetrated into the tunnel, an incredible thing happened. These lines instantly formed. It was like looking down a rifle barrel because the lines were swirling slowly counterclockwise. I encountered some intense electricity. There were like flashes going on and off. And all I could see was this strange grayish, yellowish fog. I call it electronic fog. And there you even see the description of a vortex, such as with the Native American claim, showing up in conjunction with the account of a cloud forming a portal. 
And sometimes, these modern mythology claims overlap explicitly with ancient mythology claims. In one case, this even happens in regards to a place that is alleged to appear and disappear in a cloud. So there was a story about a gentleman in Rendlesham, England, who one night went for a walk in the woods, and while he was walking in the woods, he claimed to see a spaceship hovering a few feet off the ground in the forest. And he walks up to the spaceship and sees there's hieroglyphs all over it, he touches the thing, and suddenly he gets a download of digital data into his head. He takes the digital data and um, to a computer guy and they, they actually translate the data and lo and behold it actually has a set of geographic coordinates in it. And these geographic coordinates turn out to be for High Brazil. And if you recall that was one of the locations described before where, you know, from mythology where you have an island that is not there and then it shows up in a cloud and then just kind of disappears into a cloud again. So maybe that's describing the same phenomenon. So let's have a hypothesis here. Let's let's say that a cloud is a portal of some kind. So taking that hypothesis into account, maybe all these other previous accounts are actually describing the same phenomenon. You know, maybe what was actually going on with the Romulus account, for instance, is people witness what today we refer to as a paranormal event, and they based this mythology on it. And the same might be true of the Feth Viata with the Atuath and Dananan in Irish mythology, as well as the High Brazil stories and the uh, the UFO stories and, and all of this, okay? Maybe they, you know, the Native Americans saw something like this as well. However, the, the reason all that looks extraordinary in these other religions and other accounts is because they're not Christian. And this is simply due to the ash effect, you know, a large population of people believe in Christianity in America, and so because of that, it's not seen as crazy when Jesus rises into clouds, but it's seen as crazy when other things disappear into clouds, like this. But it may simply be true that all of these are actually real. Who knows what the basis of these stories actually are, but these commonalities could be pointing to a common underlying reality, rather than derivation from mythology. However, if Jesus disappeared into the clouds, and I know you don't believe that, but just take that on board for a second, then disappearing into the clouds is not some one-off event that is facilitated by magic that only works on Christianity and nowhere else. No, no, it, if that happened, it would have been a phenomenon allowed by some undergirding metaphysics. And if it is, then it happening with Jesus would not be the only time it shows up. And so if Jesus rose into the clouds, then we would actually expect to find it elsewhere in either reports in mythology or, you know, modern day accounts or whatnot, and you sh that would actually explain it. You would actually expect to see it showing up in mythology elsewhere, rather than it being, you know, just a, a copy and paste from one mythology to the next. This, of course, sounds far-fetched, but the point is, is that people do report this stuff. This is a, a perennial aspect of the human experience. You know, this is not the first time people have reported stuff like this, and it's certainly not going to be the last. And, well, the nature of reality actually does permit this, as I pointed out before. So, who really knows? You know, we don't really have enough to posit a probability. You know, if you're going to go with materialism, then yes, of course, the probability is going to be 0.0001%. But, as I pointed out before, that's completely false. You're essentially living in the matrix, and it's a mental matrix on top of it. So, we simply don't have enough to say that, uh, you know, the probability is 0.01%. It may actually be 50% or 60% or whatnot. And so because of that, we may actually need to change our intrinsic skepticism simply because materialism is false and this sort of metaphysics is true instead. Things that we think can't possibly be true might simply be par for the course given the actual nature of reality as it is. And so then our skepticism about such accounts wouldn't really be justified. Now, regarding your Enoch video, which, by the way, I found fascinating, this same methodology applies. So let's apply this sort of methodology here. The same methodology applies to historical realities undergirding religion and not just to the metaphysical realities undergirding it. A typical religious claim would be that the Genesis Flood account is original and unique, and they may as a result reject other accounts. Your claim, by contrast, is that the Christian Flood Enoch and the Eden account are based on myth borrowed from the Critias, namely Plato's Atlantis narrative. Both are possible, but let's go the third route and see what comes up. So Plato's account and the Biblical account have common elements. 
God slash angels producing hybrid giant offspring and the subsequent corruption of man, followed by a flood. Then there is the Eden component, but I will forego that for now. So now, what if instead both accounts are based on something actual? You know, I saw Johanna James on your channel a while back, and I think she would probably have a rather different view than you on the Critias and whether or not the events in it are actually based on something real. You might want to ask her about it. So now, flood accounts are common. Everyone has a flood account, after all. The Egyptian flood account, for example, as recorded in the Ed from Building Texts, describes the seven sages who came from an island called the Homeland of the Primeval Ones, which is destroyed in a flood, and then its survivors go off to try to restart civilization. The seven sages obviously have some parallel to the Epkalu, which are thought to be the motivation behind Enoch's Watchers. Either that, or they share a common ancestry with that story. Well, this homeland of the Primeval Ones supposedly had the Urshu living there, which were a race of lesser gods, and that name actually translates as Watchers in Ancient Egyptian. Well, how about that? So that is an independent story from either Genesis or Plato's account, but it appears to mirror both. In fact, if you recall, Plato began his Atlantis narrative by saying that he got it from Egypt by way of Solon. So let's look further. According to the Edfu texts, the words of the Seven Sages were recorded by Thoth. Well, let's see if we can use that detail to see if we can pick up even more data on this. This time not from Egyptian mythology, but from one of Egypt's top historians, Manetho, who was roughly the Egyptian equivalent of Herodotus, and who was about as authoritative a source as you could get in the ancient world on history. After the Great Flood, the hieroglyphic texts written by Thoth were translated from the sacred language into Greek and deposited in books in the sanctuaries of Egyptian temples. Well, that's odd. Manetho's history account overlaps with the figure from Egyptian mythology, but it also references him preserving texts across the Flood. And what's the date that Manetho gives for this Flood? Well, he says it's 9,000 years before his time, which if you notice, is actually pretty close to Plato's date for the sinking of Atlantis. Manetho was something like 200 BC, and Plato I think was like 500 BC, which is about the same time they're referencing. And Plato said Atlantis sank at 9,500 BC, 9,000 years before Solon slash Plato. So uh, if you notice, this is actually the same date as Meltwater Pulse 1b, also known as Catastrophic Rise Event 2 in geology, which separates the Pleistocene and Holocene in science. So there's actually good scientific reason to believe that there was a great flood at this point in history. Now, what would these texts be on? Well, Thoth, it turns out, is the Egyptian cognate of the Greek Hermes, who in turn is the basis for the name Hermeticism. And so, what is Hermeticism? Well, we just got done discussing what Hermeticism is. That's the metaphysics behind occult magic. And so now, what did the Watchers teach in Enoch? Among other things, magic. And so now, what was Thoth recording on these texts? according to Manetho. Well, according to Manetho, these were actually hermetic texts that were being recorded across the Flood. Well, that's interesting. Now, consider a hypothetical. What if the Palmer's case is valid? Now, I'm not saying that it is. I mean, they make an interesting case, but I prefer to suspend judgment on it beyond a certain point. But let's say that it is. Well, if what they are saying is true, then you get to this very radioactive conclusion, which is that hermeticism matches to highly advanced physics that this was known about at a time when we were supposedly still hunting woolly mammoths. Of course, that would be crazy if it were true, but hypothetically if it was, how would you explain something like that? The only way I could think of is if you have something like Book of Enoch beings showing up to tell them. Of course, I'm not saying that is true, which is precisely why I suspend judgment there. However, given that the basic metaphysical framework already matches the physics well, you really can't rule it out. Our normalcy biases might be inclined to rule it out, but then again, as I pointed out before, our normalcy biases are radically wrong. It may also be that the metaphysics just so happens to be incidentally corroborated by the physics, and that the Palmer's additional parallels in the Quantum Hermetica are bullshit, and that the mythology and occult claims associated with it are also just bullshit. But then again, other than appeal to our already proven to be wrong normalcy biases, how would you even put a probability on that one way or the other? But if you can't rule it out, then Genesis 6, or Enoch, or Jude and Jesus' references to Enoch, might not be mythology either. Rather, the other mythic accounts that Enoch is purported to be based on might simply be referencing something that actually happened in reality. Of course, you may then still say, 
then why Christianity specifically rather than the others? Well, that is a good question, which is certainly not without merit, but that would be for another video. Anyway, I look forward to talking to you about this. If you want to come onto my channel sometime, or vice versa, I would be very happy to have you. I'll see you around. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out the books in my Alaris novel series, Alaris, The Lances of Light, and Alaris, The Pearl of Heaven, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well, at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism.